This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Now, <clears throat> what are persons and how do they exist? The topic of this colloquium, what are persons and how do they exist, was outlined by the organizers of the colloquium as follows. We use the term persons not only for naturally existing individual human beings, but also for non-natural entities such as juridical persons, dramatis personae, and the person of God. Without considering these uses... Is the micro... Is it on? Switched on. Is it on? No, it is. Oh, thank you. Is this better? Shall I start over? Okay, um, the, you know what the, the, the organizers call the, said about the persons? Um, we use the term per, person not only for natural, ex, naturally, natural persons like you and me, but also non-natural entities like juridical persons, dramatis personae, and the person of God, without considering these uses of the word person as equivocations. This raises the question of what persons really are and how they exist if they are not conceived as merely natural beings, but also not explicitly as non-natural entities. Now that's what the organizers said. I say this, this formulation is an intriguing one. On my view, what persons really are are human persons who evolved without human intervention but the organizers say, there's no equivocation, but as the organizers say, there's no equivocation in calling dramatis personae, et cetera, persons. The reason that there's no equivocation, in my view, is that the application of the term person for entities that did not evolve naturally is a case of what Aristotle called prosian hanonymy. In the, in the categories. Prochian hononymy is the phenomenon of homonyms that get their meaning by reference to a central paradigm case. Aristotle used the example of healthy, the word healthy. We may speak of healthy food, healthy complexion, and healthy urine, but to understand these locutions, we must understand the locution healthy organism. Aristotle took the focal meaning of healthy to come from its application to organisms. If you do not understand what a healthy organism is, you will not understand what healthy food is or healthy, a healthy complexion. Healthy food is food that conduces to the health of an organism. Healthy complexions are complexions that indicate a healthy organism. So human person, I think, the term human person is like the term healthy. If you do not know what a human person is, you will not know, understand what dramatis personae are. Dramatis personae are characters played by natural human, uh, natural human persons. Juridical persons are entities deemed by the law to have some of the rights of persons. So in both cases, there's a linguistic difference, an asymmetry between the anchoring or independent use of a term, sometimes called the focal meaning, like healthy organism, healthy person, and the tethered or dependent uses of the term, terms like healthy food, juridical person. But there's no equivocation. They just get their meaning. Some, some uses of the term person get their meaning by, by reference ultimately back to th things like us. So, uh, the, the meaning of, the, of healthy, the term healthy, in its tethered or dependent use depends on its meaning in the anchoring or independent use. Similarly, the meaning of person in its tethered or, in, or dependent use depends on its meaning in the anchoring use. 
Just as there is a big difference between the use in which food is healthy and the way, I mean, sorry, the difference between the way in which food is healthy and the way in which organisms are healthy, so there's a big difference between the way in which juridical persons are persons and the way that we are persons. There would be no healthy food if there were no organisms, and there would be no juridical persons if there were no natural persons. We conceive of, of the other persons, we might call them persons by convention, in relation to natural persons like ourselves. The one example that does not fit neatly into this scheme, I'm sorry to say, but it doesn't, um, is God. Unlike us finite persons who came into existence at various times, God, if he exists, does not come into existence at all. He is eternal. The use of person to refer to God stemmed from the word to, use to refer to the masks worn in ancient Greek and Latin rituals. Even so, today we use the term person of God to indicate that some of God's attributes are analogous to ours. The person of God refers to a divine being that has certain of the mental properties or analogs of the mental properties of a natural person, uh, properties like will and intellect. So linguists now want to distinguish between linguistic, a linguistic dis difference and an ontological difference. Linguistically speaking, our use of person to refer to God depends on our use of person to refer to natural uh, human persons. However, ontologically speaking, if we're speaking about re reality, the being of God, Ontologically speaking, assuming that God exists, his, his really being a person, as opposed to his merely being called a person, is ontologically prior to us and to everything else. But I suspect that the word person in person of God adds only the presumption of intellect and will to the simple word God, where the words intellect and will are anchored in the use of those terms to refer to attributes of human persons. So we can treat person in person of God as another case of Protean Hanamani, where God is a person by analogy to us. That's just a linguistic point, it's not an ontological point. If, if all this is right, to answer the title question, what are persons and how do they exist, the only questions that we need to investigate concern the nature of natural persons like ourselves. We do not need a separate investigation of the other kind of entities that we call persons. The persons by convention, or in the case of God, persons by analogy. We do not need to investigate them separately because they are characterized by their relation to natural persons like us. So what are persons and how do they exist? I'll start with the second half of this question. We may have evolved naturally with or without divine help, but I do not believe that we can read off what we are most fundamentally from how we got here. My interest is ontological here. That is, my interest focuses on questions of what genuinely exists, questions of what must be, must be mentioned in an inventory of what is genuinely real, not reducible, but genuinely real on its own terms. What kind of entities are we fundamentally? I'll develop my view in contrast to two other influential views. Until recently, the prevalent answer to the question, what is a person, has been that we, human beings, persons, have or are immaterial souls. I'll call this view immaterialism. But the modern synthesis in biology makes it clear that we are continuous with the rest of the animal kingdom. So immaterialism is challenged by the view that we are just animals, just primates, one kind of primate among others. Animalism, this view is called. I believe that both of these views, immaterialism and animalism, are inadequate. According to immaterialism, each of us either is or has an immaterial soul. But as critics as early as those of Descartes were quick to point out, there's no hint of how immaterial souls can be linked to organic bodies. 
Immaterialism falls short by not showing how we are how, how, by not showing how, how we with our alleged souls are related to the animal kingdom. Animalism, by contrast, takes each of us to be identical to an animal. There, there's no fundamental difference, according to animalism, between us and the other primates. However, if I am essentially this animal standing here, then I could not exist without this organic body. In particular, I could not survive replacement of my organic body, this animal, by a non-organic body. We all know by now of the stunning innovations in biotechnology. Not just artificial hips, knee, knees and hearts and livers, but also cochle cochlear implants and br brain machine interfaces that allow totally paralyzed people to operate robotic limbs with their thoughts. If you've not seen a video of, a video of this, it's worth looking at. It's really remarkable. So a, a woman who'd been paralyzed for something like 15 years and all completely paralyzed, uh, the brain scientist built an interface that connected her brain to a biotic arm so that when she th thought certain thoughts, she, her biotic arm would reach out, pick up a glass of water, and she would drink from it, still paralyzed completely in all of her natural parts. I mean, it's just, okay, with stunning, stunning innovations in biology. A person can survive replacement of organic bodily parts by many kinds of increasingly sophisticated artificial devices. At some point, computerized replacements of parts of an animal will be so extensive and so integrated that the resulting entity will no longer be an organism but will still be a person. In fact, I don't know about even the person I saw in the video, if she had say, um, artificial hips, artificial knees, uh, an artificial heart, artificial, all the organs we know that can be transplanted, plus an artificial something in her brain, I'm not sure we would want to say that her body was an animal body. That already might be enough so that we would say, no, it's no longer, it's not an animal body, I think. But I, I'm not going to press that point. At some point, okay, uh, at, so, at some point, I think it will be, the uh, non-organic replacements will be sufficient so that we won't call the body of a person always an animal or an organic body. It will not be an organism because organisms are essentially carbon-based. And these artificial bodies will be mostly or wholly non-organic or hence non-carbon-based. According to animalism, your organic body is essential to you. So if it is possible that you can survive without your organic body, then animalism is false. Animalism is not just up to the changes wrought by, by biotechnology. So neither immaterialism, which makes our connection to the animal kingdom a mystery, nor animalism, which takes the particular organic bodies that we now have to be necessary for our survival is adequate to the nature of human beings, or as I shall say, human persons. I use those terms synonymously, human being and human person. We need another approach besides immaterialism and animalism, and I believe that I have one. I shall defend a view called, that I call constitutionalism that skirts both problems of, anim, of animalism and immaterialism. According to constitutionalism, persons begin, human persons begin existence constituted by, but not identical to, animals or organisms. The relation of constitution is a relation of unity, but not strict identity. When an, a, when an animal constitutes a person at time t, there's a single entity at t, at t, a person constituted at t by an animal. Behind the idea of constitution is an Aristotelian assumption. For any x, we can ask what most fundamentally is x. My answer will be x's primary kind. That's what x most fundamentally is. Everything that exists is of, is of exactly one primary kind, a horse, a cabbage, a passport. A thing's primary kind is essential to the thing. 
It determines the thing's persistence conditions, the conditions under which it survives or doesn't. When something of one primary kind is in certain circumstances, something of another primary kind comes into existence. When, say, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom are in certain circumstances of chemical bonding, a new thing, a water molecule, comes into existence. Or when a piece of paper of a certain kind is in certain circumstances, there are legal circumstances, all kinds of circumstances, not just physical, but when a, when a piece, certain piece of paper, a, a piece of paper of a certain kind is in certain circumstances, a new thing, a U.S. dollar bill comes into existence. Similarly, when a human organism is in certain circumstances, a new entity, a person, comes into existence. The circumstances in which a human organism comes to constitute a person are the development of consciousness and intentionality. That is, a person comes into existence when a human organism, or a fetus, develops the ability to support what I call a rudimentary first-person perspective. Persons and animals are of fundamentally different kinds. Animals are essentially organic, Persons are essentially bearers of what I call first-person perspectives. Anybody, organic or not, that can constitute a person must be able to support a first-person perspective. Constitutionalism differs from both immaterialism and animalism. Unlike immaterialism, constitutionalism is a view that shows how we persons are related to the animal kingdom. Persons are essentially embodied, and we begin existence constituted by organisms. Unlike animalism, which regards a person as just another primate, con constitutional, uh, constitutionalism is consonant with unending progress in biotechnology. Our relation to our bodies is not the timeless and necessary relation of identity posited by animalism, but rather the time-bound and contingent relation of constitution. However, what distinguishes us from all other entities is that we are of a kind that develops what I'll call robust first-person perspectives. On my view, a first-person perspective is a two-stage dispositional property. First-person perspectives have rudimentary and robust stages. Very roughly, the distinction between the rudimentary and robust stage, stages correspond to the difference between consciousness and self-consciousness. Before explaining the two stages of the first-person perspective, I want to list some of the features that do not set us human persons apart from the rest of nature. First, we, like the rest of the animal kingdom, evolved via natural selection perhaps guided selection, as Plantinga insists, or perhaps unguided evolution, as Dennett and many biologists insist. <clears throat> it would take us too far afield to argue here about whether belief in God is compatible with natural selection. So I remain neutral on this matter here. The present point is that we need not posit any special beginning to account for our existence. Oops, excuse me. Wake up. <laughs> Second, persons and non-human animals don't differ in what we're made up of at the beginning of our existence. Both persons and, and non-human animals have the same kinds of organs made up of the same kinds of carbon-based cells. It has been estimated that we share 98.6% of our genetic material with chimpanzees. <clears throat> that may explain a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Third, we, like other species, are social beings. There is empirical support for the social character of primates, including us, who begin life constituted by primates. The psychologist Michael Tomasello gave cognitive tests to two-year-old human beings and to adult orangutans and chimpanzees and found that the only places in which the human beings outscored the non-human primates were on tests that measured social skills. 
Social learning, communicating, and reading the intentions of others. Fourth, <clears throat> we, like other primates, are problem solvers. There's voluminous literature on non-human animals solving problems. For example, Scientific American reported on work that showed that bonobos and orangutans not only can use tools to get a fruit treat from a mechanical apparatus, but they can also plan ahead. I take it that non-human animals' problem-solving ability indicates that the non-human animals have consciousness and intentionality. And on my view, entities with consciousness and intentionality have the first stage of the, the first-person perspective, what I call the rudimentary first-person perspective. An entity with a rudimentary first-person perspective can perceive and interact with things in the environment. Moreover, like most people, I take human infants to be persons who have rudimentary first-person perspectives, just as non-human, many non-human animals have rudimentary first-person perspectives. What then sets human persons apart from animals? Because it's important to me that we're unique. How can human infants be persons, but in chimpanzees not be persons, despite the similarity of DNA and the fact that both kinds of beings, human infants and chimpanzees, have rudimentary first-person perspectives? What's the difference between them? Because I think that a human infant without, with just this rudimentary first-person perspective is a person, but a chimpanzee is not. I'll give a preliminary answer here and let answer more fully at the end of the talk. Constitutionalism offers two kinds of answers. One answer is of mainly technical interest. And I'm, one, of my, one of my goals in philosophy is to make philosophy, analytic philosophy of the kind I do, more relevant to people's lives than just these technical problems that people talk about all the time. I really want to bring it down to earth. Well, anyway, that's what I'm trying to do. But the first answer is a technical answer. <clears throat> the technical answer is that only persons have first-person perspectives essentially. And animals that have first-person perspectives have them only contingently. The animal, a chimpanzee, say, exists as a fetus before developing a rudimentary first-person perspective, and so does not have a rudimentary first-person perspective essentially. The person doesn't exist, doesn't come into existence, until constituted by an organism that can support a rudimentary first-person perspective which the person then has essentially. That's one reason to make, say, a person is not identical to an animal, because a person comes into existence with, as a person. A person's not reducible to something else. I'm going to pass over this first answer to the question of what makes us special what different from non-person constituting animals, because I think that the second answer is more revealing of the kind of thing that we fundamentally are. The first one's not wrong, I think, it was, but it's technical, and a lot of people would say, who cares? I wouldn't say that, of course, because, you know, I got a PhD in this subject. <laughs> the second answer to the question of what's the difference between human infants and chimpanzees in virtue of which the infant but not the chimpanzee is a person is this. Human infants but not chimpanzees are of a kind, that a primary kind, that typically develops what I call a robust first person perspective. Human infants, like chimpanzees, have rudimentary first-person perspective, but unlike chimpanzees, human infants also have a second-order capacity to develop a, a robust first-person perspective, to develop, develop a robust stage of the first-person perspective when they master a natural language and acquire a self-concept where a second-order capacity is a capacity to develop a capacity. Now let's look more closely at the rudimentary and robust stages of the first-person perspective, beginning with the rudimentary stage. Here are three important features of a rudimentary first-person perspective, whether had by a chimpanzee or a, an infant or, or you and me, who also have them too. 
First, it is a perspective. A perspective is not an object. It is not something that one occupies. To have it a, a perspective is to be disposed to perceive the world from a particular point of view. Second, even the rudimentary first-person perspective is first-personal. It does not explicitly refer to its bearer, first-personally or otherwise, but yields the default location of a conscious subject. The source of her perceptual field, the location from which the subject perceives the environment that she interacts with. Three, a rudimentary first-person perspective does not require linguistic or conceptual abilities. So entities that lack concepts, human infants and non-human animals, may both enjoy rudimentary first-person perspectives. I should say that I think that concepts are tied to natural language. If there were no natural languages, there would be no concepts. As, as that's the end of my di digression. As I mentioned, there are two conditions for an, an entity to have a rudimentary first-person perspective, consciousness and intentionality. An entity has consciousness only if it is capable of being conscious of something. The term perspective is appropriate because all conscious, consciousness is perspectival. What intentionality adds to consciousness is minimal agency, goal-directed behavior. Just, there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of uh, empirical work on, on newborn babes and, and even, even just a few minutes old, they, they have no trouble finding their mother's breast. That's intentional behavior. They have no trouble imitating somebody where you stick out your tongue, tongue protrusion it's called, that the infant sticks out its tongue. 42 minutes old, they do this. This is, that's Alison Gopnik's work. Um, an entity with only a rudimentary first-person perspective has mental states, but no self-concept or self-understanding. The entity simply stands at the origin of that part of reality that it can perceive and interact with. All its perceptual uh, mental states are first-personal by default, but the bearer of those mental states does not think of them as first-personal. An entity with a rudimentary first-person perspective just scratches where it itches, not where something else itches or another entity itches. The hallmark of a rudimentary first-person perspective is the ability to perceive and to act intentionally upon the world without having a first-person concept of oneself or a self-concept. Now turn to the robust first-person perspective. That's the first stage, is a rudimentary first-person perspective that we share with, uh, that we, we share with uh, some non-human animals. Not just primates, we share them with lots of mammals, maybe all mammals, pigs, and cows, all of them. A robust first-person perspective, now we're moving to the second stage, a robust first-person perspective is a conceptual ability acquired when a toddler learns a natural language. It is the capacity to think of oneself as oneself in the first person. It is the capacity not only to think, I am hungry, or baby is hungry, or food, but also to think, I wish that I were not hungry. Where the second occurrence of I and I wish, that I, were, I wish that I were not hungry, signals your conceiving of yourself in the first person. You, thought of in the first personal way, are part of the content of your thought, not just the thinker of that thought. Although persons share with higher non-human animals rudimentary first person perspectives, only persons ever develop robust first person perspectives. Hence, the second important difference between human infants and chimpanzees. Human infants are overwhelmingly likely to develop robust first-person perspectives, but chimpanzees never do. And we can talk about Gordon Gallup's uh, experiments later if you want. Let me illustrate the robust first-person perspective with a little fantasy that I have used before, but I, I like it. Suppose that Jane Jones is a billionaire hedge fund manager who, naturally enough, believes that she, she herself, is wealthy. 
She has a robust first-person perspective if she believes that she herself is wealthy. But one day she's abducted. She's hit on the head and left unconscious on the side of the road in rural Vermont. When she recovers, she cannot remember her prior life, but her first-person perspective is as robust as ever. She can conceive of herself as herself and wonder if she'll ever regain her memory, she'll, if she'll ever know again who she is. She squeezes out a living on a, sheep, on a sheep farm in Vermont and regularly reads the newspaper of, in the newspaper about one Jay Jones, the missing hedge fund manager, who's in fact the person reading about this person not knowing it's the same herself. Jones thus comes to believe that Jones, the hedge fund manager, is wealthy, but that she herself, working on a sheep farm, is not. Then our sheep farming Jones wins the Vermont lottery. At the same time, she reads in the newspaper that due to mismanagement, the hedge fund that Jones used to run has crumbled and that Jones is now a pauper. Still not believing that she herself is Jones, Jones believes that she herself is wealthy since she won the lottery, but does not believe that Jones, whose fortune has been lost, is wealthy. So after her abduction, Jones believes that Jones is wealthy, but not that she herself is wealthy. And after winning the lottery and reading the, of the hedge fund's demise, Jones believes that she herself is wealthy, but not that Jones is wealthy. Therefore, therefore, Jones's belief that Jones is wealthy is not equivalent to Jones's belief that she herself is wealthy, since either belief can be true when the other is false. The robust first-person perspective is the ability to conceive, to make that distinction, to conceive of herself as herself in the first person, and thus to, to, to distinguish between thinking of someone who is, happens to be yourself and thinking of yourself as yourself in the first person. The point here is that whether she knows it or not, Jones refers to herself by Jones just as surely as she refers to herself by I, the word I. So the difference between her saying or thinking, I believe that Jones is wealthy and I believe that I am wealthy, is not a difference in who or what is being referred to. The difference is that the thought that Jones expresses by, I believe that I am wealthy, is a different thought with different truth conditions from the thought that she expresses by, by I believe that Jones is wealthy. The first, I believe that I am wealthy, but not the second, I believe that Jones is wealthy, manifests Jones' capacity to conceive of herself as herself in the first person. That distinction is a distinction that is never made by the scientific folks because they think it's easy to say, you, 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 if you believe that you're you yourself are wealthy, that's just X believes that X is wealthy. No, the X believes that X is wealthy just gets, gets X to believe that X is wealthy under some description, not that she herself is wealthy. Um, so that, uh, okay. A robust first person perspective is a conceptual capacity, I already said that. Um, it is directly manifested by someone's entertaining thoughts like, I am glad that I am a philosopher, or I wonder how I am going to die. No name or description can replace the second occurrence of I in any of these sentences without changing its meaning. When I wonder how I'm going to die, I'm not wondering how Lynn Baker's going to die or how the person writing this or standing in front of you is going to die. I wonder how I am going to die where the, where the second I expresses a self-concept. A self-concept does not stand alone. In order to acquire a self-concept, a language learner has to have a battery of empirical concepts like hungry, toy, mama, and so on. Acquiring the empirical concepts requ requires learning a natural language with words like hungry, toy, mama, and so on. And one could not learn these words unless one were in a social and linguistic environment. Our being social entities 
enables us to learn natural language and with it to acquire self-concepts and an explosion of further conceptual abilities. I mention this to show how far I am from Descartes. When you say first-person perspective, people immediately think of Descartes. But how far I am from Descartes, who took for granted that if he were alone in the world except for an evil demon who was deceiving him, he could have this, entertain the thought that he was sitting in front of the fire and that an evil de de demon might be deceiving him. That's in the first meditation, as you no doubt know. On my view, if Descartes had been alone in the universe except for the evil demon, he would not have had the, the conceptual resources to suppose that he was sitting in front of the fire, much less that he might be deceived. Without a language-dependent, robust first-person perspective, Descartes could not have entertained the thought, I may be deceived that I am sitting in front of the fire. Without others to teach and correct him, how would he even have acquired the concept of a fire or of sitting? So my idea of, of a first-person perspective is decidedly non-Cartesian. So how we, how we, the kind person, came to be? Well, we can tell a, a credible evolutionary story about how animals developed to the point of constituting persons. It is easy to see how consciousness and intentionality, the ingredients in a rudimentary first-person perspective, could have been produced by natural selection. I think it's easy, anyway. Mutations that produce whatever neural patterns that can constitute consciousness and goal-directed behavior would surely have enhanced the chances of survival. Animals that are consciousness and, and that behave in goal-directed ways have more, more behavioral flexibility and hence are more likely, more likely to be adaptive than other, otherwise similar animals that lack consciousness and intentionality. Species by species, animals with higher levels of consciousness and more fine-grained intentionality are likely to have an evolutionary advantage. So perhaps there was an evolutionary period during which there were, there were animals with rudimentary first-person perspectives, but no robust first-person perspectives. Perhaps there were hominids, but not yet persons. I think that's altogether possible, that there were organisms that were hominids, hominids that did not have a robust first-person perspective, but had rudimentary first-person perspectives. The young hominids had rudimentary first-person perspectives, but not yet had, had a second-order capacity to develop robust first-person perspectives. There were social beings in that world, or in that time, but they were not, <clears throat> not yet fully linguistic beings. When groups of hominids invented language and brains evolved to the point of being able to support a robust first-person perspective, a new kind of being came into existence, a person. Perhaps not biologically new, but ontologically new. A being with new kinds of causal powers. For example, causal powers to learn complicated syntax and to devise complex conventions that govern complicated transactions, like the transfer of property. <clears throat> My conjecture is that the acquisition of language by our species made an ontological difference in the kind of beings that there are, persons constituted by animals who have first-person perspectives essentially, and who typically acquire robust first-person perspectives. We human animal persons are, are a kind linked to the animal kingdom by our ancestry and rudimentary first-person perspectives. But what makes us unique, unique in the universe, I believe, are our robust first-person perspectives, our ability to think of ourselves in the first person without a name or description. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, now, how you and I, individual persons, came to be. <clears throat> Constitutionalism, among other things, is an account of how particular entities of various kinds come into existence. Everything we know of that came into existence after the Big Bang came into existence gradually, from solar systems to organisms to automobiles coming off assembly lines. 
So I take vagueness to be inherent in the world. So it is with persons. There's not an exact moment when a person comes into being. When a late-term human fetus d develops a rudimentary first-person perspective, it comes to constitute a person who has a, who has a rudimentary first-person perspective or has a, has a first-person perspective, rudimentary in this case, essentially, and also a second-order capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. The result, as we have seen, is a person constituted by an animal. The unity provided by constitution allows the fetal organism to hand off, as it were, the first person perspective to the person that the organism is beginning to constitute. It is as if by passing off the rudimentary first person perspective, the constituting organism cedes its ontological supremacy to the person that it comes to constitute. The fundamental unity of a person is provided by the first person perspective. Now we can see how a human infant is a person, but a chimpanzee is not a person, despite the fact that the person and the organism are biologically similar, and both have rudimentary first person perspectives. They are ontologically distinct. The difference is that the, the human infant, but not the chimpanzee, essentially has a remote or second order capacity to develop a robust first person perspective. Let me explain further this remote capacity to develop a robust first person perspective. A normal toddler has a, a remote or second order capacity to ride a bicycle. She has a capacity to develop the capacity to ride a bicycle. Once she learns how to ride a bicycle, she has an in-hand capacity to ride a bicycle. Analogously, a normal human infant has a remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. Once she develops a robust first-person perspective via a self-concept, via learning a natural language, she has an in-hand capacity to conceive of herself in, as herself in the first person. Since a robust first-person perspective is unique to persons, a chimpanzee or other organism that does not constitute a person has no such remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. So according to constitutionalism, a human infant, but not, say, a human fetus that does not constitute a person yet, has a remote capacity to develop a robust first-person perspective. One does not have a remote capacity to develop a first-person perspective perspective until she has in hand a rudimentary first person perspective, but also has, has a remote c capacity to develop a robust first person perspective. They are of a kind, they are of a kind, they are of a kind that, de that typically develops the in hand capacity, they are, we are, I should have said, we are of a kind, that typically develops the in hand capacity for a robust first person perspective when we learn a language. To, so to sum up, uh, up this point so far, the difference between a human infant who is a person and a chimpanzee who is not a person is that the human infant, the person, is of a kind whose members typically have the capacity to conceive of themselves as themselves in the first person. Chimpanzees are not members of such a kind. Now what makes me, me, we're all persons in this room, there are lots of pe persons in this room, but one is me and one is Antonia, one is you. What makes me, me, this person, is that I am this exemplar of a first person perspective. Now that is an uninformative piece of verbiage I just gave. It's uninformative, uninformative but I think it is the price of non-reduction. Inform, to, to be informative requires non-personal con conditions uh, non-personal conditions for persons. If you had non-personal conditions for, that are necessary and sufficient for persons, then you'd have a reduction of persons to those conditions. We don't, I don't want a reduction. I don't think we're reducible that way. So I think there's no informative way to say, to say what makes this the same person at this time as this one later at this time. So what makes you the same person that, that you were 
20, 10, no, maybe 10, five years ago, some years ago. What makes you the same person? What makes you the same person is that you are the same exemplar of a first person perspective. But that's just to say that you're the same person. That is, it's not informative. But as I say, I think that non-informativeness is the price to pay for non-reduction. And I, I myself think non-reduction is worth that price. So now, why does a robust first person perspective make an ontological difference at all? Why don't we just say that persons are identical to animals who have this special feature, namely a capacity to develop a first person perspective? Well, there are at least two reasons. First, although I'm happy to leave biology to the biologists, my account is ontological, and I see no reason to suppose that ontology should recapitulate biology. The robust first person perspective is crucial, as I'll illustrate in a moment, to civilization, but does not seem so important to biologists. One of my goals is to regard the animal kingdom as seamless with no sharp breaks. To suppose that certain animals, human animals, have a unique feature which is unimportant to biologists but crucial to us and crucial to characteristic human activities seems not only to split, to make a split in the animal kingdom, but also to make a split in a way unsanctioned by biologists. Second, what makes something fundamentally the kind of thing that it is, is not always what it is made of. That's just a physicalist mistake. What, what's made of, what your passport is made of is irrelevant to its being a passport. What, what your, your 20 euro bill is made of is irrelevant to its being a 20 euro bill. I mean, it's not irrelevant entirely because it has to be something sanctioned by the law, but, um, but they could change. They could change. You could change. They could change the composition of the 20 euro bill, uh, uh, and then you, you would, oh, you got it, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know too much about euro bills. Okay, um, uh, okay. It's fun, what makes the, something the fundamentally the kind of thing that it is, is not always what it's made of, for example, organic material, but rather what it can do. What makes something a clock is that it is intended to tell time regardless of what it's made of. Clocks can be made of jillions of different ways, lots of different ways. What makes something a person is it's, a, is it's essentially having a fir, rudimentary, rudimentary first person perspective and a remote capacity to develop a robust first person perspective. This capacity is a non-qualitative dispositional property which is sui generis, not reducible to any third personal properties. A, fir, a robust first person perspective brings with it a host of new kinds of causal powers with significant enough differences, I believe, to support the ontological uniqueness of persons. Let me illustrate this point. Robust first person perspectives are implicated in many of the characteristic activities of persons, activities in virtue of which they make contracts, celebrate anniversaries, have the ambition to become Miss America, unless they're too old, to become philanthropists who want new buildings named after them, to keep diaries, and so on. We could not even have many of the thoughts that we have without having robust first-person perspectives. Even trivial thoughts like, I wish I were a movie star, are direct manifestations of a robust first-person perspective. No one could have such a thought unless she could conceive of herself as herself from the first person. Let me just list some of our causal powers that surpass those of animals that do not constitute persons. One, item. We share with several species the ability to communicate with conspecifics, but only we persons have a fully articulated language with resources for considering necessity and possibility. Only we worry about explaining modality. We share with, item, we share with several species the trait of having a perspective on our environments, but only we persons have rich inner lives filled with counterfactuals. Ah, oh, if only I had locked the door. Item, we share with several species <clears throat> methods of rational inquiry 
the dog sniffs around where he saw the bone being buried yesterday and digs there. But only we persons deliberate about what to do and attempt to rank our preferences and goals and try to resolve conflicts among them and thus be rational agents. Item, we share with several species activities like self-grooming. But only we persons have self-narratives. We share, item, we share with several species the ability to make things that we need, for example, nests. But only we persons make things that we don't need, for example, enough nuclear warheads to eliminate the human race many times over. Item, we share with several species the property of having social organization, but only we persons commit war crimes, have international courts, and acknowledge human rights. Item, we share with other species the property of having a rudimentary first-person perspective, but only we persons can be moral or responsible agents. All these differences between persons and other entities rest on our having robust first-person perspectives. Robust first-person perspectives bring with them a cascade of new kinds of abilities. We can plan for our futures. We can deceive ourselves. We can try to reform. We can go on diets. We can have rich or empty in, in our lives, and on and on, both with respect to the range of what we can do, from trying to control our destinies to fantasizing about the future, and with respect to the moral significance of what we can do, from assessing our goals to confessing our sins, it is obvious that beings with robust first-person perspectives are unique. The extent of the difference that the robust first-person perspective makes is a mark that we persons are ontologically different from animals. Let me sum up by reiterating that the important difference between a human person and, I mean, sorry, a human animal and a human being or person is not a biological difference, but an ontological difference. I recognize that ontology is not everyone's cup of tea. However, it is having, it is having a first-person perspective, essentially, that shows how we can be material objects without being essentially animals. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if we are material objects that are not essentially animals, we must reject both immaterialism and animalism, and constitutionalism rejects both. Constitutionalism avoids immaterialism by not appealing to any immaterial entities like souls. Constitutionalism avoids animalism by taking organic bodies to be inessential to us and by recognizing the changes wrought by bio biotechnology. According to constitutionalism, as long as a body supports a first-person perspective, it constitutes a person, no matter how many inorganic parts it has. What links us to the animal kingdom is that we begin existence constituted by human organisms that support rudimentary first-person perspectives, and what sets us apart from all other entities is that we typically develop robust first-person perspectives. In sum, constitutionalism beats, meets both of the goals set out at the beginning. It both ties us to the animal kingdom and it shows that we are unique. In conclusion, finally, in conclusion, I offer constitutionalism as my theory of natural persons and I can true what I call persons by convention, entities such as juridical persons and dramatis personae as un ontologically dependent on natural persons. My constitution theory of persons explains the linguistic asymmetry in the use of the word person in terms of an ontological asymmetry. According to my theory, when a new natural person comes into existence, a new entity comes into existence. When person is used in the anchoring sense, when the word person is used in the anchoring sense, persons have ontological significance. To say that persons have ontological significance is to say that any inventory of concrete objects that lacks persons is incomplete. But when one of the persons by convention comes into existence, 
persons by convention comes into existence, person is not used in the anchoring sense. No new entity comes into existence. A character in a play is not a new entity, ontologically speaking. It is rather a role that an already existing natural person can play. A corporation is not a new entity when a court deems it a person. It simply acquires new properties. The persons by convention do not have ontological significance in virtue of being persons. Natural persons like us do have ontological significance in virtue of being persons. So we end up with, account, with an account of what finite persons are and how they exist. Thank you. <laughs>